Well, it had to happen. It, it was inevitable, wasn't it? It was inevitable that I would, on the final show, I'd be late by one minute. I'm not on uh, military or railroad time anymore. Yes, uh, it is a kind of bittersweet occasion. It's the final show. I'll try to I'll try to put on a demeanor that's more sweet than bitter. Um, and you guys, you you people who are tuning in, have been so great that I now I call you the family. You're the family, and I'm not gonna abandon the family. I'll be back. Uh, I'm not gonna be back with a here and gone. I might come back with an occasional live concert. Pardon me from the kitchen. Drinking coffee here. That's the serious stuff. When I started the show over a year ago, 60 some shows ago, I started drinking uh, tea in the first year. And then I got back to the real stuff. Just for that extra oomph. Um, that I want to give you. And uh, so content is king. And uh, I'm going to supply some for you tonight. Uh, tonight, I might go a little overtime. You'll forgive me, I'm sure. Boyd is here, who we used to call Big Bird. Thank you, Mike. Um, that means a lot to me. I appreciate, I appreciate it from both of you, Mike and John. And I enjoyed uh, your pictures uh, of your, your fantastic trip recently. Arlene is here. Raj is here. Big Bird up in New Hampshire. I don't know if you got the news. This is the last show. But, yeah, you're going to dance. Jamie's here. Jamie and I are going to do a show for you. So, Jamie... He's going to come over, and we might do it outside like we did last week with uh, Jenny and Steve and Annie and Eli. And the plan is I'd like to uh, do a whole show with Annie sometime. Uh, she's actually one of the greatest singer-songwriters I've ever known and ever heard. Um, and... As my mind wanders here for a moment, I have some big news tonight, um, which I'll share with you, the family, and I hope Jimmy and Margie take a turn around the kitchen tonight as I play some music too, besides tell, and I got a couple of really good stories. <laughs> You're not supposed to say your stories are good. That's for others to decide. But uh, you've told me you, the family, you've told me they're good. So I've got a story that I told almost probably a year ago. And that story is called My Bodyguard, which is absolutely true. And it happened in Watchung Hills High School days. So I welcome anybody from my old alma mater, Watching Hills High School. Oh, man, I'm all tangled here. Hang on a sec. <laughs> known as Jim Flynn, the hardest working man in show business out here in the eastern seaboard area, plays with countless blues bands and classic blues people. And let me tell you why I'm mentioning him, because one night when I was, I don't know, 18 or 19 maybe, his band, who were comprised of Alan LaBeouf, Jamie Flynn, Mike Bonagora, 
and and that was it. Oh no, no, Steve, I think was playing that night, and it was probably Steve who got me on this gig at what was essentially a stripper bar <laughs> in Central Jersey, out on Route 22. It's now a, a generic, you know. I don't think they have Charlie Browns anymore, but it, that's what it's like. I think it's called the Office. Um, Sandy's here. Glad to have you in the house, Sandu. And your lovely, lovely wife, Deb, in case she's overhearing any of this. Sandy is a bass player extraordinaire and now also a uke player. Sandy, I'm going to do a uke song for you tonight that I wrote this year. I've been doing a lot of writing. And so that's one of the central motifs tonight. Um, originals and writing. And I discovered and embraced the idea very early on that I was not just going to emulate the Beatles songs by learning how to play Blackbird, etc. But I was going to emulate their creativity and their dedication to writing. <clears throat> so I started writing around the age of 13. And for three or four years, it was a terrible, terrible struggle. There were no teachers, no songwriting teachers. Uh, my friends hadn't really started writing yet, like Alan. And when I was 16 years old, a couple of things happened. One was that my uncle Mike Kuhn, a well-known hematologist, gave me this guitar. Yes, I got this guitar over 50 years ago. It's a Guild Classical. It was built in... Hoboken, New Jersey. It's a Mark II. It's made out of mahogany. Which means it was kind of a budget classical. And these signatures did not come with it. Uh, somewhere in the 90s when I was teaching guitar, I one day decided to get one signature on it, which was Father David, a priest, that I taught him how to play Happy Birthday to You. And then now it's a real Hall of Fame, including uh, the famous writer, Cal Newport, who was just quoted in the uh, New Yorker magazine. And all the people are famous to me. They're all famous. And then I ran out of space and at this point, I don't know if I even get it signed anymore when I get a new student. I just tuned it up and it was way under. By the way, I was 16, so in my 16th year, I went to Switzerland with my best friend, Tony Paticchio. Now, after all these years, Eli, my son, is 16. I brought this guitar on the plane on the Swiss Air airline. They allowed me to bring it on the plane and put it on a, in a closet. So what did Paul McCartney say recently? Something that was gold, and we were all waiting around for him to be quoted on this. He's been quoted on everything else in life and in the world. And uh, they said, what's your advice to songwriters? What is your advice to songwriters? Now, considering that he's maybe the world's greatest songwriter of all time, um, we were uh, waiting uh, with bated breath to hear the answer to this. What's your advice to songwriters? And in a nutshell, I'll paraphrase, he, he said basically just to keep writing and write all the time. And, and he... He basically dismissed his first couple of songs. He said they were junk. And uh, he said, by around the fifth or sixth song, you might get something. So around the time I was 17, maybe 18 at the, the most, I got this song that I'm about to play you. And this night that I opened for this little rock band of friends of mine at this stripper bar, 
It wasn't a stripper bar the night we were playing. We weren't uh, playing for a stripper. We were just doing a gig. And I got up with this guitar, which had no pickup in it. I just had to put a microphone on it. We, it was pre-even knowing that you're supposed to have a pickup in your guitar. And I got up and sang a couple of songs. Jimmy Cross was there, who was in the chat room with Margie. I could barely believe my good fortune that I'm still friends with him. And he came to see that gig. And on that night, I played this song that I'm about to play. The first song that I wrote in, in my first five or six songs that I suddenly felt like something clicked and I became a songwriter. So all of this is tied together tonight in this big, beautiful puzzle coming to the pieces falling into place because tomorrow, starting tomorrow, I am going to be uh, recording a series of EPs on CD now. And I'm not going to put them out on Spotify or YouTube or or Apple Music, or any place. They're just going to be CDs. And uh, if you want to hear the songs, you have to get the CD. And I'm going to crowdfund it through GoFundMe. And because uh, I, I did the math, and crunched the numbers, and I can't make a CD anymore without going deeply into the red. So I just cannot afford to do that at this point in my life. And so uh, you guys, I'm sure, will help. In a sense, in fact, my dear brother-in-law Scott Orth Orthy is the first contributor. Uh, he he got in under the radar and contributed before the uh, funding is ha has even opened yet. And guess what? On the very first CD, this is going to be a series, and the series is called Grace Notes. Grace Notes Volume One, Grace Notes Volume Two, and there are going to be seven songs on each CD. I don't think people want any more than seven songs. Even even Paul McCartney would say, you know, his own family doesn't listen to his whole record anymore. You know, th there's nobody who listens to an entire record of 14 or 15 songs. And yet people are still stuck in that mindset. They spend a year making records that nobody's going to hear or listen to. Except maybe their wife. And and believe me, even my own wife's not going to listen to a CD if I put 14 songs on it. So I'm going to put seven songs. And guess what, friends? The first one is going to be this first song that I've never recorded before that I played that night in that stripper bar that Jamie Flynn came up to me and said, that's a great song. I don't I don't know you that well, and we never met that much, but you, you we might have met once before. He said, you really got something with that song. And I asked him at the age of 18 or 19 to come up to my house and try a drum part on this song. 50 years ago, the numbers start to get quite daunting, but now all these years later, Jamie has consented to playing drums on my version of this song, Gene, that I'm about to sing you that I wrote on this guitar. I'm not gonna play it on this guitar, I think. I'm gonna play it on a better guitar, on the guitar that I, I'm gonna record it on, on the Grace Notes album. But I'm gonna show you what it sounded like in my little room. I wrote most of it in the downstairs bathroom <laughs> in our house in Wachong. And I came up with this little motif. guitar. It's time to start work even though you don't feel alright. Why must the show go on? You don't eat and you can't seem to sleep. You're never awake and sometimes you seem dead on your feet. Why can't you I have waited 
storms coming through Not the love or the months and the years on the road yeah. You know you can't quit it It's gonna quit you Close to home, it's true. But try and break the rule. Can't you see that the poet is right? If you force the rhyme, you'll be throwing away the night and wasting. I have waited for you and the day when you'd pack up your dream and come home. Gene, you've been waiting so long for the dream that they told you would come. All the nights I first song that I wrote that really kind of made a breakthrough for me. I'm a director and an engineer and a performer tonight, so I have to do something. Forgive me for a sec. What do I got to do here? Well, that view looks right, and then when I look at the other view, it doesn't. Anyway, I'll, I'll forge on. Um, that song is going to be on the first record. Thank you, Sandy. That means a lot to me. Thanks. Jimmy Garibos here. Another drummer that I've been blessed to play with. Um, Jim, this is the last show, in case you didn't check that out. Um, got a bunch of good musicians in the in the audience and some great music appreciators already um sandy thank you very much the last verse has a line in it that only an 18 year old might have written which is can't you see that the poet is right if you force the rhyme you'll be throwing away the night well when i got to that line i was like really but you know what? I'm not going to change it. I'm going to keep it the way it was. And now this brings us to a really unusual deal here, a really unusual situation. And that is, you know what? I, bear with me. This is going to be weird to anybody who tunes in and sees a blank screen. But I have to grab something to put that lyric sheet on. Here it is. I got a, I got a stool to put the lyric on, and and this brings us to a very unusual, and I hope, in a good way, unique. Stampy wants to come in. He's meowing. Maybe a, he should come in. Okay, Stampy, hurry up. Come on. Here he comes. You know, he had to make an appearance on the last show. It's always, the ratings always go up every time. The load makes an appearance. Mm-hmm. Right, little boy? 
He's like, what the heck is going on here? How did I get myself into this? But look at the patience that he exhibits. He's like, now he wants to get down. But he's like, oh, it's all right. I'll take a look around up here. So I keep interrupting myself. But in any event, oh, that reminds me. Hang on. I got to take some things out of the freezer before they freeze. I was chilling some uh, some drinks. Have you ever done that? Do you know what happens to a can of soda if you leave it in the freezer? It explodes. So, music, stories, and household tips tonight. Um, a chock full of information. Uh, one of the oh bits of information I have to share is I'm back to playing live gigs post-COVID. And the post-COVID gig that I'm playing down the shore is this Tuesday in Ocean Grove at the Pavilion, not the Grand Auditorium, which I could barely fill up the first, the first row of the Grand Auditorium, but out on the boardwalk, I'm going to play at 7 p.m. It's a free concert as I understand it. It's produced by my friend Jim Winder. Jeez. It's lucky I tuned this. And I'd love to thank you all by name, all the people who have supported the show financially, and I do still need your help. So I do have the tip jar up there. You can scroll up to it. What does that mean, the virtual tip jar? That's just a nickname I have for the PayPal. And some people have backed off of it and said, oh, I can't do that. I don't have a PayPal account. And I'm like, no, it's not that. You don't need a PayPal account to donate to PayPal. You just go to PayPal to the link that I provide, and it brings you to my page. And then no matter who you are, millionaire or pauper, you can donate. So Tuesday in Ocean Grove at 7 p.m. on the boardwalk, I'll be there with this guitar. And what's that unusual situation that I mentioned to you? This unusual situation is right around the time I wrote Gene. I think the very next song that I wrote was this next song. And it was supposed to be a song that the character Gene was going to sing in a club. You follow? I wrote it for her. And I never finished it. But there in Wachung, New Jersey, behind the pond, we had some people over. I was 18. I was going uh, out with my first girlfriend, who was my next door neighbor. And she was just the greatest. I loved her dearly. I wrote a story about her in my book of short stories, but a fictionalized account. This is a book of fiction that I wrote. There must be a better world somewhere. It's on Amazon. Um, Sally was there. Her mother was there. Sally and Mr. and Mrs. Doors were there. We used to have people over all the time. And... I played this song, this the unfinished version of this song, for the gang. And Mrs. Doors, lovely lady, she thought it was me singing, which is a, a, a an occupational hazard, isn't it? That people are going to think it's you, not a character. And she said, oh, Chip, that made me so sad. It, it'll be all right. Just hang in there. It'll be all right. Because this song is called Too Tired to Feel It Tonight. But I thanked her. She, she just moved my heart that she would be sympathetic to me. And again, guess what? In this post-COVID writing bonanza that I've been going through, where I, I'm not exaggerating when I tell you I've written 50 songs in the last year and a half. And that doesn't mean much, except for the fact that about 30 of them are keepers. You know, you can write 
volume writing, I call it, where you just write song after song after song. And I tried it once. I wrote 40 songs in uh, 30 days or something. No, it was the opposite. I wrote 30 songs in 40 days. And I don't think a single song survived. Have a drink, have a cup of coffee or tea or a bottle of scotch or whatever moves you. Jenny's here. Jenny was here last week. And Jenny, we got so many compliments and nice comments about that show. So thanks again for you and Steve coming. Hey, Gary. Gary is here, my uh, old friend and classmate from Watching Hills High School. Uh, I always enjoy seeing Gary every time he shows up at a gig and even now when he shows up in the chat room. Terry's here also from uh, the class, from, from the school, from Watching Hills High School. Uh, Terry, I don't think we were in the same class. Paul is here, so I think that... <laughs> no, Stampy does not want to go out. He would never come back, Mike. He's a house cat. Um, so... In this rush of writing, I'll get through this story. I finished this song 50 years later. I finished it about six months ago. So Gene, the singer that I wrote the song Gene about that I just played for you, is supposed to be singing this song, and I'm going to sing it for you now. And I'm going to record this on my first installment of Grace Notes Volume 1. This is going to be on it, too. And Jamie, you'll be the judge if you should play this with brushes. It should have a light touch, but I'll get you to play on it. And uh, here we go. I'm going to sing it for you now. This is the one where Jerry Doors said, Chip, don't worry, it'll be all right. I've been waiting so long. For the break I know is coming I've been crying my songs And I wonder where my friends have all gone yeah. As I stand here alone I feel sorry for the writer Who has given his songs Cause I know that I am doing them wrong Cause my own My life was meant to be, but for now, I'll play it by the book.
There it is. That's going to be recorded on the first installment of the new record, which is called Grace Notes. And I've got the typical, you know, premiums and offers and da-da-da-da-da. You know what? I, I found out, in a way, that that kind of stuff just kind of confuses the issue a little bit, doesn't it? Um, now, thinking back to my first show 60-plus weeks ago, I remember that one of the first songs I ever played... <coughs> was a song that's almost impossible to play on the acoustic guitar. Unless you're Eric Clapton, who wrote it. And Bobby, Bobby Whitlock. He's got a great YouTube channel, Bobby Whitlock, with his wife. His wife's name is Coco. Something's wrong there. Um, and he said, you know, and this is the mystery of songwriting, the mystery that, you know, these songs come in, in waves. They come in, in different, at different times. And there are, time, there are times when you just feel like you, whoa. You get songs at the right time. You know, Stuart Copeland, the drummer for The Police, he picked Sting to be in his band. That was The Police was Stuart Copeland's band. And he picked him because he was a good-looking tenor who played bass, who was a substitute school teacher. He said, when I asked him to be in my band, I didn't know he was going to be bringing songs to the band like every breath you take. He would come in and every song got better. You know, he'd be like, here, you want to record this one, Every Breath You Take? Yeah, I think we could record that one. Which became the number one song of the entire decade, by the way. So, songs are mysterious. They come at various times. Eric Clapton was standing outside of Bobby Whitlock's door in England. Bobby Whitlock, of course, is from down south in America. And Bobby Whitlock said he was outside the door playing this song. He said, I just got this song. And like I said, it's not easy to play a guitar, so I'm going to do my best just to reminisce about one of the first episodes of Here and Gone. Bell Bottom. I don't want to lose this feeling If I could choose a place to die It would be in your arms, yeah Do you want to see me crawl across the floor? you do because I don't want to fade away. Give me one more day, please. I don't want to fade away. In your heart, I want to stay. It's so I was strong, but I lost the fight. You won't find a better loser, no. Do you want to see me crawl across the floor to you? Do you want to hear me beg you to take me back? I'm glad you do because I. Day. 
Could to do the whole guitar solo, etc., etc. Hey, you know what, though? While I have capo two, <coughs> pardon me, I'm gonna refurbish this guitar a little bit. So, I do have another EP. I don't even think I have any physical copies of it left, but it's on iTunes. But you know what? Two years ago, when Apple Music started their subscription service, iTunes basically died. So, so when iTunes died, my income died with it. Friends, boo-hoo. Sorry, I'm, I'm not complaining. Well, yes, I am complaining. Uh, all my royalties dried up at that point. Because you know what you get for uh, somebody playing your song on You Know Who, the robotic speaker? If they play it, you get 0. .00035 of a cent, uh, whatever. Um, so, and I had to play, pay George Harrison's estate. $300 in mechanical fees to record his songs. Do I begrudge him, a multi-multi-millionaire and his family? Not at all. When you write a song, you own it. It's your property. You're a farmer and you own the, the lower, the South 40, and you have to farm it. And... I won't say anything more about the whole messed up situation. But when I do this Grace Notes series of EPs, oh, I'm going to have a couple of little twists and original twists and turns on it, but I won't go into those now. I'll just say that if you don't buy the CD, you won't be able to hear the songs, and I know a lot of you will want to buy the CD. Thank you, Jenny. Love it. Thanks, Boyd. I'm looking forward to getting it there for you. Um, in the meantime, I still need help tonight. Just uh, go visit that tip jar, folks. This is one of the songs I recorded on the EP, which is called Here Comes the Sun. My cousin, Larry Dunning, requested it last week, and I told him I would play it this week. I don't think he's in the house, but he might watch the rerun of this, and if he does, I hope he hears this song.
they bought and sold I look at the world and I Every mistake we must surely be learning. Still, my guitar gently For you and for Larry, another big piece of news coming your way tonight on this final Here and Gone show. Uh, my book, which has been the story of my life, well-received critically and embraced on Amazon with 27 reviews, most of them four, most of them five-star reviews. I, I know I'm touting it, but hey... I'm proud of this book. There must be a better world somewhere. It's fictional short stories. I have a new book coming out this summer, my first children's book, and it's called Garbo Speaks, which is about Garbo, the garbage-eating raccoon. He won't be eating garbage in this children's book. He's going to be playing the ukulele. Garbo is, and so it's being illustrated as we speak. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Mrs. Calabash. Who used to say that? The guy with the big nose, Jimmy Durante. Um, Denise is here. Hi, Denise. Good to have you. Debbie is here. I'm glad to have you in the chat room here, Debbie. Um, this is the last show, so you kind of caught me at the at the end here. Um, Tomorrow, more news will be released about the Grace Notes record. And I got a couple of stories to tell tonight. Maybe I'll tell one now. Then I'm going to do a James Taylor song. No, no show would be complete, as I fix my pants here, um, without a James Taylor song. I've written uh, a couple of songs with his brother, and I've written a song with his sister. Livingston Taylor uh, and I wrote a song called When Will the Hurt Go Away. That's going to be one of the songs on the Grace Notes CDs, not on the first one, but it's going to be one. I'm going to do one uh, CD that's going to be pretty much geared towards the blues, at least one that's going to be geared toward the blues. And The first one so far has Gene and uh, Too Tired to Feel tonight. And Jamie, guess what? I might record the great old blues classic on the first album because it's right in the mode of Gene and Too Tired to Feel tonight. And that is St. James Infirmary, which I'm sure you'd be happy to play on. Now, the stories. There have been bear sightings this year. Tons of them. My friend up in North Jersey has one in her neighborhood. And I don't know, they call it the Chatworth, Chatworth's Bear or something. And it's, it's just wandering around the neighborhood. People are worried about their dogs, etc. 
there are zero instances of dogs being attacked by bears in New Jersey, but we had a clean record up until two years ago where you could have easily dismissed all these, you know, people who are, are uh, panicking, and you could say, no, 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 nobody's ever been attacked by a bear. But then two years ago, tragically, a Rutgers student was killed near my friend's house up in North Jersey, where this group of students went jogging. They saw a bear and they did everything wrong. They did the textbook and it's, it's just horrifying, but they tried to outrun it. I saw a bear once at night in Wachung. It was eating out of my garbage can, and I startled him in the middle of the night, and he ran, and it was one of the most frightening things I've ever seen, friends. He ran as fast as a greyhound, and you looked at it, and you went, on your best day, you couldn't outrun a bear for 20 yards, even if you were 20 yards from your house. Yes, Jamie, I'm glad to have you. Thanks, Boyd. Uh, so here's my story. I live in Bucks County now along the Delaware River. You know, bodies of water always attract animals. And uh, they need to drink, and so they live by bodies of water. So... Uh, when we lived, when Annie and I lived over in Hunterdon County before Eli was born, we lived outside of Stockton in a little apartment. And I don't remember if it was there or when we were living in an apartment in Bucks County in Solberry or whatever. But I was over there in Flemington, and we had heard that there was a bear walking around in downtown Flemington over the weekend. And uh, I'm like, what? And, and so I was down there for something, and there was this great little Italian bakery. I think it's still there. I think it's still there. It's been run by the same family for decades, and I think it is in the Staples Shopping Center now. But in those days, it was on the circle in this little orange building. Some of you will remember it. There was this great little Italian lady who ran, ran it and uh, had the most luscious pastries. So I'm in there one day. By the way, I have a sweet tooth, which doesn't work out that well for me as a diabetic. And um, there was a new, uh, not a New York Times, there was a Courier News on the counter. And on the very front page of the Courier News, there was a picture of this bear walking down Main Street in Flemington. Some photographer came out and got a picture of it. And I said to the lady, did you see this? You had a bear in your town this weekend. On Saturday, he was walking down Main Street. And the lady, in utmost seriousness, looks at me and goes, that bear was in this bakery on Sunday morning. And I thought I was not hearing her right. I, I was like, come again? What? She said, that bear came in the door the electric sliding doors. I heard the door beep and I came out and I saw no one here. So I went back into the kitchen. She said she didn't see the bear because he was on all fours. He's looking in the glass case where the donuts and pastries. Maybe he wanted a bear claw. I, I don't know. But he's looking at them all. And she said a guy who comes in every Sunday morning for his bagels startled him, came in the front door, and startled him, and he ran. Startled him? What about the guy? The, the guy, can you imagine going home on Sunday morning in a suburban town? Not This isn't in the deep woods. Flemington is just suburban New Jersey, friends. And you go home that Sunday morning with your soiled underwear and say to your family, uh, I, I just encountered a bear coming out the front door of the Italian bakery. I ran right into him as I was going in to get the bagels. They would probably call the doctor on you and uh, say that you should be examined. 
I'm going to do a James Taylor song. And this James Taylor song has special resonant meaning. Why? Eli and I just went to see Peter Asher play at the Sellersville Theater. It was great. Peter Asher and I have met four times in my life. And I spent an entire evening hanging out with him once in New York City. And depending on the state of his whether he's caffeinated or not or whatever he either remembers me or doesn't remember me on any given occasion that I run into him on this occasion he was kind enough to actually kind of pretend that he remembered me which made me feel good in front of Eli and um, he said oh yeah I remember you anyway when he was given the job as A&R man for the Beatles new label Apple Records, that's what his job was, to discover people. And he said James Taylor came to his apartment and played him some songs, and he was like, okay, I'm going to bring you to the Beatles. This guy's great. And then James Taylor, when he was 20 years old, had to play an audition for who? Paul McCartney and George Harrison. No pressure there, right? James says... Uh, I have no recollection of that meeting at all. My mind was just a complete blank. I played them one song, and then I had to sit in the waiting room, waiting for 15 minutes. And when Peter Asher came out, he did this. And uh, James Taylor said, my life changed from that moment on. Uh, so, yes, as, as if the Beatles uh, needed to do anything more in our estimation, but... They also discovered James Taylor. James Taylor was the very first signing to Apple Records. And when he was 19, 20 years old, when he was 19, he wrote this song. When he was maybe 20, he played it for George Harrison and, and Paul McCartney. And I'm going to play it for you now. There's something in the way she my way or calls my name that makes me leave this troubled world behind if I'm feeling down or blue or troubled by some
Okay, the thought crossed your mind, didn't it? As you heard that song. Wait a minute, something in the way she moves. What did he do? Steal that line from George Harrison? No, it was the opposite. It was the other way around. George Harrison heard that line, and then he wrote the song, Something in the Way She Moves Attracts Me Like No Other, and he couldn't come up with the word there. As you saw in the Get Back special, he's asking John, he's asking Paul, Attracts Me Like What? And uh, Attracts Me Like a Pomegranate, is what he said. John said, just keep singing any nonsense words and he said something will come to you isn't that strange friends that that when you hear attracts me like no other lover it sounds like so completely obvious doesn't it and yet that is the mystery of songwriting it isn't obvious to us as we write the songs i've agonized over lines many many times when I was writing songs, I've agonized, and then it kind of just defaulted to the simplest line. You know, who knows, who knows. So here's what Paul McCartney does now when you go see the master, the 80 year old, he takes out the uke and he plays George's song. Something in the way she moves. Attracts me like no other lover. Something in the way she moves me. I don't want to leave her now. You know I believe in how. fret okay i told sandy i don't even know if he's still here told him i was going to play an original ukulele song and if i have time i will but the time is racing by and i can't say i'll see you next friday i'm not gonna be here next friday i'm ending the show tonight uh for various reasons but if you enjoyed it, if you've enjoyed the run over the past year, if it's done anything to entertain you, enlighten you, bore you <laughs> to tears, whatever, do me a favor and just visit the uh, tip jar. I'd greatly appreciate it. I have a brand new song. It's a new blues. And pardon me for saying this, but it's kind of in the epic mode. It's a six minute long blues, so I'm going to do that at the end of the show no matter what, even if I go over time. I wrote it just yesterday, and so the, the streak continues as I uh, have written song after song after song. And I attribute a lot of that to you, that you've been waiting here on Friday nights, you've joined me, and I wanted to have something new to sing for you. So I kept writing songs, so now I'm going to record them starting tomorrow. Tomorrow I'm going to start recording them and I'm going to release a series of EPs called Grace Notes. And that series is going to be crowdfunded by people. And uh, so tomorrow I'm going to open up the, uh, the GoFundMe page and see what happens. Um, sorry to say I cannot go into the red anymore just to release an album which is what most people do they're vanity projects they have to do it and and by the way i i don't want to sound critical about people who make albums you have to do it they used to say after the movies started in the 1920s you know what they uh the battle cry was then the novel is dead what happened when mtv came out you know what they said radio is dead Radio reaches billions of people still. It's as popular as it ever was and more popular. CDs are going to come back, in my opinion. Uh, they're, they're in a little bit of a trough right now, and the LP, 
And you say, Chip, why don't you make an LP? And I'll tell you why. Here's why. It takes nine to 10 months to get an LP manufactured, which means if I finished the recordings today and delivered the master tapes to the manufacturer, it would not get here by Christmas. You know, I mean, that's, that's pretty daunting. So eventually I might get some of them compiled onto uh, vinyl. We all love vinyl here. We got a turntable set up. Eli and I listen to a selection of great records these days. A little more Java. Um, what do I got to do? I have to tell you this story. Um, I'm going to indulge myself and tell you one funny story. And it's about my first girlfriend, Sally Doors. I, I referenced her early. And I wrote a, so uh, a song. I wrote a story about her in this book and it's called first swim of the year and yes it's a fictionalized version of her but it's pretty much her she was a great girl a great first uh first girlfriend to have she was really great uh, i loved her family they loved me eli would you turn that down please um And so she came from England with her family, and they came over, and uh, you know what? One day after we were kind of hanging out together, and she said to me just kind of off the cuff, she said, oh, my, my old boyfriend found out about you, and uh, he's coming over today after school with his friend to beat you up. Uh, and I was like, huh? What? Come again? Yeah, my old boyfriend, he's jealous and he's coming over. Oh, good. Hi, Sandy. Um, I'm glad you, you sat in. You hung in. Um in Watchung Hills High School, great high school, loved it. Sally Doors says to me, and then I'm stewing in homeroom, and I'm just beside myself. I'm a lover, not a fighter. I'm a musician. I don't, I don't sully these hands on some bully's mug. And that's just a way of saying, I would have got my ass kicked if this guy came over with his friend and he was incomprehensibly to me and I still I wondered if it was even true or if Sally was just maybe exaggerating a little I don't know to make this jealousy thing happen but I'm stewing about it in homeroom and it was Mr. Zlucky <laughs> I was in Mr. Zlucky Z-L-U-K Why? and Mr. Zlucky's still around he's in his 80s he was a great guy and a great homeroom teacher. But I'm stewing, and we sat in alphabetical order, friends. And in alphabetical order, Greg Malachuk, rest his soul, rest in peace. I don't think he's still in the land of the living. He was a huge guy, and he was, he was a fighter. And he got in fights all the time and kicked ass all the time. And Greg Malachuk said, Murgot, what are you stewing about? What are you complaining about? I go, Sally Doors told me your old boyfriend's coming over after school today to beat me up. Uh, I'm like, well, I don't know. what What's that about? And Malachuk is like, relax. Don't stew about it. I will come home with you today on the bus. And nobody's going to beat you up. Okay, Chip? Oh, okay. Thanks, Greg. He indeed rides home with me on the bus. I live behind a pond in Watchung, New Jersey, up on the hill behind Best Lake. My house is no longer there, but we're sitting on the front porch. We're having a lemonade or whatever after school. It's a beautiful sunny day. And I'm thinking, this isn't even going to happen. This is, this is all imaginary. And suddenly a bus or a car stops at the end of the driveway and drops two guys off. And they were 
They were formidable looking guys. One of them had like a black leather jacket on maybe. I, maybe I'm just exaggerating now and making that up. But they didn't look friendly. And um, they looked like they were on a mission. And I, I'm up on the front porch going, what? Oh my gosh, they're here. Malachuk was like, relax. I'll handle this. You stay here. You don't even have to come with me. And I see him walk down the driveway. And from my perch up on my front porch, I see Malachuk doing this. He's like gesturing, big gestures with his hands. And he talks for a couple of seconds, 30 seconds or whatever he's gesturing. And then the two guys just turn around and walk away. And I'm like, okay, what happened there? And Malachuk comes back and uh, I said, what, what did you say? What, what happened? He said, oh, well, I, I just told them. You know, if they came one step closer, I was going to break their necks, kick them in the you-know-whats, uh, and, and I was going to absolutely annihilate them if they came one step closer. And they decided to leave. <laughs> it all worked out kind of like a movie, didn't it? This is the 4th of July weekend, and before I play my final song, night and my final song of the uh, Here and Gone show, I'll play this song um, for our 4th of July weekend. And I have CDs, I've told you, I've got this EP of George Harrison songs, I've got an EP called American Guitar, I decided to record some of the classic patriotic songs, and... Uh, Please don't get me wrong. I said I was it was a bittersweet night, and this is on the bitter side, but it sold nothing. It sold absolutely nothing. It didn't even get downloaded, which I completely don't understand. I mean, even by random searches of people playing acoustic guitar versions of patriotic songs, you'd think that a bunch of people would have discovered it and downloaded them, and no, they never did. So my... My, uh, my track record is perfect. I have uh, never been able to get the numbers up yet for anything. I'm not giving up. But I wasn't able to get the num numbers up for this show. And that's why I'm uh, ending it. I'm sorry, I wish I could say there was another uh, more deeper reason, but... It's just that you guys have been so great. I love you all. You're the family to me. And I could just never expand beyond 15 or 20 people. Which isn't enough to keep the show going. So, but like I said, I will be back. Jamie and I are going to do a show, maybe from the backyard. It's not going to be cold here and gone, though. It'll be just a, a concert or Friday night uh, live or something. So here's one of the songs off of American Guitar.
So, coming down to the last song, a song I just wrote uh, a night or two ago, and uh, I'll barely be able to really get through it, because I, I don't know it yet that well, but I'll, I'll do my best. This has been the way I've operated the show. Thelonious Monk says good night to you all. Thank you for hanging in there with me. Thanks for coming along for the ride on Here and Gone. And uh, come and see me down in Ocean Grove, New Jersey, this coming Tuesday, July 5th at 7 p.m. out on the boardwalk. Bruce and Patty will be there. No, I'm only kidding. I don't know if they'll be there. They won't. It's unlikely. <laughs> reverb that's all right we can fix that easy enough <laughs> uh this is called when you were mine and it's kind of it's kind of a long blues that's what it is so thanks again God bless you, and we will meet again someday, Lord willing. I got it from the kitchen table. And you took your suitcase out the door. What a way to leave me With my heart in pieces on the floor How could a love so right End up feeling like shining I never even felt the rain when you were mine for one golden moment you took away the pain sit here with my head in my hand as heavy as a stone wondering how it all came down so fast And I ended up here alone How could a love so strong Ever go so gosh almighty wrong sun was shining I never felt the rain I dropped a beat there when you were mine for one golden moment I didn't Thank you.
for one golden moment. You took away the pain, yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you.